welcome back. So, we were discussing conditional PMF, we said if x and y are discrete random variables, conditional PMF uh, P x comma y of x sorry P x given y of little x given little y is defined as P x comma y of little x comma little y over P y of y right. This is just probability that x is equal to little x, y is equal to little y over probability of y is equal to y. Assuming so, this all this assumes that this is positive. So, uh, x and y are discrete random variables. Uh, so, they take some countable set of values, right? And you're, what you are doing essentially is that you are fixing, let us say, a value, particular value y, right? And asking what condition on y equal to y, what is the uh, conditional PMF of x, right? So, you are just scaling this joint. Uh, for that given y divided by so by the probability that y equal to y right and if you are given a joint pmf you can find the marginal by just adding over all x right so this guy so this guy is simply uh, sum over all x of pxy of xy right that's the denominator so if you are given the joint joint pmf you can find the conditional pmf Okay, and since this is this has to be positive, only then is the conditional PMF defined. So we discussed this last class. Are there any questions on this? So I'll now state a the theorem. Let x and y be discrete random variables, then the following are equivalent. And four for all x, y, and r such that P y of y is greater than zero. we have p x given y of y equals p x of x. So, this uh, this theorem is actually a fairly simple theorem to prove 
right this it, it gives equivalent conditions for discrete random variables x and y being independent okay so we've already defined independence of random variables x and y uh, as the corresponding sigma algebra as generated sigma algebra as being independent so we know what this means and this for the specific case when x and y are both discrete uh, this is giving further condition further equivalent conditions which are easier to verify often for discrete random variables okay rather than go hunting for sigma x and sigma y and prove that they are independent sigma algebras the equivalent conditions you can verify which are, which is enough to say that x and y are independent okay so the following are equivalent meaning that so there are four statements i have said are equivalent statements so what does that mean so okay so what the first of all if i say two statements are equivalent what the, what does it mean ha so if i say statement a and statement b are equivalent a implies b and b implies a correct so if i say that uh, two statements are equivalent i have to prove two results this direction and this direction right so here i am saying four statements are equivalent which means i should prove how many statements ha huh? Twelve statements I have to prove, right? Is that true? So I for so I can pick any four choose two ways of picking these statements, right? Six statements, and I have to prove two theorem both ways, right? So I have to prove twelve theorem. There are twelve results in this, right? But often you don't have to necess. That is what it, logically that's what you have to do, right? You have to prove that this implies this, this implies this, right? And then this implies that, the, the third one, and so on, right? You have to exhaust twelve statements. but often what you can do is you can prove a circular 1 implies 2 implies 3 implies 4 implies 1 right that kind of a thing is also fine right often you may be able to get away with verifying a smaller subset of these 12 statements right so in this case uh, actually see some of these are trivial right the equivalence of 2 and 3 is quite trivial right right so we are saying this says that the event x is equal to little x and y equal to little y are independent events and the equivalence to the pmf factorizing is very obvious right it's almost like from the definition it follows straight from the definition right in fact the equivalence of 2 3 and 4 is very easy right that i will not do okay it's very uh, easy to verify proof equivalence of 2 3 and 4 is easy okay i will not do it you it's almost from the definition okay so if you buy that 2 3 4 are equivalent how many statements do you now now what do you have to prove it's enough to prove that one implies any one of these guys right any one of these guys and conversely if you assume any one of these 2 3 4 it implies one that that would be enough right there any questions so let us prove that 1 implies two how do you prove 1 implies two so you are assuming that x and y are independent right and you want to prove that these two are independent events right how would you prove that ha huh. so the sigma algebras so if x and y are independent sigma algebras generated by x and y are independent sigma algebras which means for any borel sets for any borel b1 and b2 we have p of x belonging to b1 and y belonging to b2 is equal to p 
x belonging to b1 times p x be y, uh, y belonging to b2 y belonging to b2 so these are borel sets in r okay these are borel sets in r so they are for any borel sets b1 and b2 in r you must have this right this is what independence of sigma algebras means correct now what how do you now what do you do next ha uh, take singleton take b1 as the singleton x and b2 as a singleton y right now take b1 as singleton x and b2 as singleton y little y right that will be the end of it because then you will have probability that x is equal to little x and y is equal to little y will be will product out which means that these two are independent events right see when i write comma for intersection that i already mentioned i think right and that's it proof is over right so one this direction is very easy now i have to prove that one of these right if you assume either 2 or 3 or 4 you are you get 1 right so assume that now let's say 2 holds right then you have to prove 1 all right So, we proceed as follows. Again, B1, B2 are Borel sets on R. Borel sets B1, B2, we have uh, probability of x belongs to B1 and y belongs to B2. So, this is equal to, so I am going to take, so, so this can be written as a summation, is not it? Summation x belongs to B1, y belongs to B2 uh, probability x uh, sorry x is equal to little x y equal to little y and you are summing over all so you are looking at the probability that x is in B1 and y is in B2 so you are looking at you are summing over all the masses that are sitting inside B1 and B2 respectively correct. So, that relation is okay. So, this is just saying that if I know the uh, the joint PMF, I know the joint, well, so it is like saying I know the joint law, right? Except except the Borel set here is of the is it like a Cartesian product of two Borel sets on R, right? B1 cross B2. Uh, now, so this is equal to, I am assuming 2, is not it? So, this is equal to. So, this will be equal to probability of x is equal to x times probability of y is equal to y because I am assuming 2, right. Now, this will become summation x belongs to b1 probability x is equal to x times summation y belongs to b2 probability y equal to y. How does this work? 
because see I, now you have factorized right. So, this x summation will only hit this and y summation will only hit that right clear and you have what you want right. So, this is equal to probability that. So, this x is a discrete random variable now right. So, this is equal to what probability that times probability that y belongs to b 2. Correct. And this is true for any Borel sets B1 and B2, right, which means the sigma of x and sigma of y are independent sigma algebras, which means x and y are independent. So, this is true for all Borel B1 and B2 in place x, y are independent. So, are there any questions on this? Yeah, so okay. So, uh, what we have said is that if you want to for if you want to talk about independence of discrete random variables x and y, it is good enough to verify that the joint PMF factorizes into the marginals, right? That is equivalent to saying x and y are independent random variables. Okay. <laughs> And unconditional PMF is something you can calculate if you are given only the joint, because from the joint you can get the marginal, and divide one by the other you will get the conditional PMF. Okay, and this condition simply says if you are given if the conditional PMF is same as the unconditional PMF, also saying x and y are independent, they are equivalent. Okay, they're very easy stuff, right? This is as elementary as it gets. Discrete random variables are very easy. Now, if you move uh, on to continuous random variables, uh, so in the discrete case we said if x takes if, if x is discrete then it takes only countable values on r with for probability 1. Similarly, y takes countable set of values on r with probability 1, then the, the pair x comma y necessarily takes only countable values on r 2 that is because Cartesian products of two countable sets is necessarily a countable set. Okay. However, in the countable case in the continuous case this is not so simple. Okay. If x is a continuous random variable and y is a continuous random variable it need not be true that x and y are jointly continuous. First of all I have not told you what jointly continuous is which I will, but what do you suspect it will be? Remember we said that uh, we said x is a continuous random variable if the measure p x is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure on R. In other words, all length 0 sets have 0 probability measure, right. So, if you are talking about random variables x and y mapping to R 2 mapping omega to R 2, what should the equivalent definition of a continuous jointly continuous x y be? Exactly, right. So, it should uh, just it should just be that. So, you have two measures on R 2 which is your p x comma y the joint law p x comma y induced by the random variables x y and you always obviously have Lebesgue measure which is area on R 2 right. Now, if for every 0 area set 0 Lebesgue measure set on R 2 you have the joint law is 0 right then you say x comma y is a jointly continuous uh, jointly continuous random variables right. But what I am saying is that it is not true if x is continuous and y is continuous it is not necessarily true that x comma y is jointly continuous. Okay. It is in the discrete case if x and y are separately discrete they are jointly discrete right. So, let me define this. So, you have just to remind you you have 
a probability space omega f p and you have your x comma y mapping omega onto r 2 okay. and we said that if x is x and y are random variables then all Borel sets on R will have pre images which are f measurable that will actually be a homework okay we you have to prove this right that the pre images of Borel sets on R 2 are is are necessarily f measurable okay. Now what I am saying is that uh, so there is two measures here one is the measure pushed by the random variables which is p x y the other measure is Lebesgue let us call it lambda for the uh, want of a better name. Uh, so, what we want is the following definition x and y are jointly continuous if the joint law p x y well p x y is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure on R 2. Strictly speaking I should say the Lebesgue measure on the Borel sigma algebra on R2, right. Absolutely continuous means that if you take any Borel set on R2 which has 0 area, 0 Lebesgue measure, then the corresponding probability law P x y must also be 0, right. Is that clear? So, if you give me any Borel set n such that lambda of n is 0, then I must have p x y of n is also 0. Any questions? So, this is just a repetition of what we said in the one dimensional case, right. Caution if x and y are continuous random variables, x and y need not be. jointly continuous. So, if x and y are separately discrete it necessarily means that the joint measure x y will also take only countable values right. So, uh, x and y are jointly discrete, but in the continuous case if x and y are separately continuous it does not mean that x comma y is jointly continuous. Uh, can you see why? Ha, roughly you are right you are talking about so x and y are separately continuous means that their joint see their marginal laws are absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure on R right, but that does not imply that the joint law is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure on R 2 right. So, if you you can just take any simple example you want let us say uh, so, just to so let us say x is uh, Gaussian uh, remember this Gaussian with mu equal to 0 sigma equal to 1 right. Uh, so, this is denoted by n 0 1 remember this example. So, this will you can take anything you want right this I am just giving one example let us say and y let us say let y equal to 2 x ok. So, x is some standard Gaussian 
you can take standard exponential for all for all for all I care. You can take any continuous random variable you want and take y equal to 2x. Okay, uh, y will also be a continuous random variable. In fact, it will be Gaussian with parameters 0 and 4. Okay, you can show. Okay, we will see that later. So then, uh, y is distributed like n04, which is also a continuous random variable. Uh, all right, but what you see is that this guy, this this measure exists. So this is your sample space omega, but your measure exists only on the line y equal to two x. Right, all the measure is sitting on that line. Right, all omegas here necessarily map to that line y equal to 2x. See why? So, x of omega is whatever it is, y of omega is necessarily twice of x of omega by definition, right. So, all the measure will exist on that line with me, but this line has 0 Lebesgue measure, it has 0 area, right. The line has 0 area. You can actually show it rigorously if you if you you can consider the line as some countable intersection of small rectangles and so on, and prove that this line has zero Lebesgue measure, and so you have all the probability measure of one is sitting on a set of Lebesgue measure zero on R two, right? So this is an example to show that even if x and y are separately continuous random variables, they need not be jointly continuous according to our definition right. So, saying that x and y are jointly continuous is a strictly stronger condition than x and y are. So, yeah what we will show is that if x and y are jointly continuous they have to be marginally continuous as well okay. that is something we will show very soon very soon. So, joint continuity is a stronger condition than being marginally continuous x and y being marginally continuous. Is that clear? Is uh, any questions? Can be seen as a two dimensional Gaussian. No, see y is it is true see x is some Gaussian and y is is equal to 2 x it is also a Gaussian y is also Gaussian you can show. Okay. What I am saying is that this is your sample space all omegas necessarily map to this line correct. That is clear to everybody, right? Because if x of omega is whatever it is, y of omega has to be twice x of omega. So, all your measure has to sit on that line which has Lebesgue measure 0. So, it is not jointly continuous. Clear? Okay, so, now suppose that x and y are in fact jointly continuous random variables which means that p x y is absolutely continuous with respect to lambda. Okay. Now, what can you say? Now, you can invoke what can you invoke now? You can invoke radon Nikodim theorem right. Actually radon Nikodim theorem holds for very I mean it holds for arbitrary measure spaces with sigma finite measures. Okay. So, uh, so, it is a very general theorem that is what I mean to say. So, that so p x y can be written as the integral of some non negative measurable function d lambda on R2, right. So, lay down the codem theorem will imply the following. Lay down the codem theorem that so if x comma y are jointly continuous random variables radon Nikodim theorem will imply that there exists a measurable function non negative measurable function 
f x y which maps r 2 to 0 infinity such that for any Borel B on R2, we have the joint law P x y of B given by the integral over B uh, f x y d lambda. This is lambda is on Lebesgue measure on the plane R2. Actually, if you if you prefer, you can just write this as dx dy. There's nothing wrong in writing it as dx dy. Right? So I mean again, this is an integral you will not fully understand now. Okay, this is a Lebesgue integral. Okay. Again, you can just think of B as being some uh, box, right? If you want some rectangle, uh, so that the probability of x and y mapping to a box is integral over that box uh, f x y dx dy. Okay, and this is saying there exists such a non-negative function. Okay, and in particular. taking what do you do now you will take generating class right so what is the generating class for borel sigma algebra on r2 ha semi infinite rectangles right so taking b equal to minus infinity x cross minus infinity y oops infinity y we have then p x y of a set like that will be nothing but what the joint c d f is not it we have f x y of x comma y which is nothing but the probability that x is less than or equal to x y is less than or equal to y equal to integral minus infinity to x integral minus infinity to y f x y d y d x. Uh, I should write maybe d f x y of x y f x y of some let us say r comma s or something like that because I cannot use the same variables f x y of s comma t d t d s ok is that ok does make sense I am not writing d x d y because I mean that is that guy is sitting outside right I cannot integrate with respect to the same variable. Okay. So, right on Nicodem theorem affirms that the C D F can be written as the integral over the semi infinite rectangles of some non negative function. Okay. Again just like in the single dimensional case this has this is called probability density function except now it is a joint pdf joint probability density function so this is called joint probability density function of x and y it is some non negative measurable function uh, again it has no interpretation of probability whatsoever only if you integrate it over a borel set do you get a probability okay and also this just like in the one dimensional case this pdf is only uniquely specified up to a set of Lebesgue measure 0. Now, are there any questions on this? Uh, ah, so, well okay, this is a point you will appreciate later. So, I was just saying that <coughs> 
see uh, the CDF or the probability law can be written as the integral of some non negative measurable function with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Uh, all I was saying is that this P joint PDF is uniquely specified only up to a set of Lebesgue measure 0. You change the function on some 1 or 2 points or accountable points or some 0 measure point does not really change the integral as we will see later. So, you can it is unique up to a set of measure 0 uniquely specified up to a set of measure 0. Uh, so, when I mean uh, so when I mean measurable f x y that means that pre images of Borel sets on r must be Borel sets on r 2 that is all I mean ok. Yeah, I mean this you will understand later you can only integrate see when we do integration theory we will integrate a measurable function with respect to a measure over a measurable set ok we will do that later ok. So, which is why this you put a question mark we will get back to it in about 2 weeks, but this you understand right this guy is just your indefinite Riemann integral fine. In fact, in this you can also it is also true that the order in which you integrate will not matter because this is a non negative function uh, then it, you, it can be shown that the order in which you integrate does not matter ok. You can jolly well just write d s d t and integrate it in the opposite order. Now, um, so if I give you the joint p d f you can integrate it and find the joint c d f, but if you are given the joint c d f you can always find the probability law right which means that uh, if I specify the joint p d f it is is a complete characterization of two jointly continuous random variables right. Are there any questions on this? Now, what you can show also is that so you have that relation right. So, I can now show that if I just consider the probability that x is less than or equal to x suppose I am only interested in uh, probability that. So, I just want to compute this let us say ok which is the probability that x is less than or equal to x say x and y are jointly continuous. So, what will I do I know the joint c d f and you know a theorem about joint c d f if you send y to infinity you get the marginal c d f of the other guy x right. So, if I send y to infinity in this relation so this is this we can this we have shown already if I send y to infinity I will get the joint I will get the marginal uh, this is f x comma y I will get the marginal of x right this is from one of our properties of joint c d f s this has nothing to do with continuous random variables, but now I am going to invoke this relation right now I am going to use the fact that x and y are jointly continuous. So, then I am going to write. So, I send uh, limit uh, y to infinity right as I said you can just integrate it in any order you want right. The I will not prove that, but just take it from me that if you have a non negative function you can change the order of integration nothing happens. If this guy can be positive as well as negative then you have to be very careful about interchanging the orders of integration. You cannot always integrate in any order you wish, but this guy is non negative. So, there is a theorem known as Fubini's theorem ok which we will not do in this class which allows you to integrate in integrate in any order you wish ok. So, you can write this as uh, integral can write this as infinity uh, all that right f x y of s t uh, d t 
d s right I am just putting y equal to infinity I am being a little bit loose I am sending. So, what I am doing is I am sending limit inside one of the integrals right all this you can do because f is non negative ok normally you cannot do all this, but here you are here you are ok ok pushing limit into the second in first integral. Now, what happens? So, if you look at so let us look at so my x variable is s right my x variable is s and my first int first integral is hitting t and t is going from minus infinity to infinity. So, if I simply just consider that bit the t integral alone right what remains will be a function of s correct and I am integrating a non negative function over minus infinity to infinity. So, what I must get is a also a non negative function this will be a non negative measurable function if you integrate a non negative measurable function you get another non negative measurable function. So, this this is some non negative measurable function ok which means I can write the C d f of x as the integral from minus infinity to x of some non negative measurable function of s which means that x is a continuous random variable correct. So, you can call this, this so let us call that some uh, let us say let us say that is g of s right g of s d s all right and g of s is non negative and measurable. So, and I am right I am saying that I can write f x of x as the integral of a non negative measurable function which means that x is a continuous random variable right because in fact radon nicotine theorem is an if and only if statement right if uh, if p x is continuous or nu is absolutely continuous with respect to nu if and only if nu nu of b can be written as the integral f d mu ok. It is an if and only if statement. So, this implies x is a continuous random variable because its cdf can be written as the integral of a non negative measurable function. This is after all I mean I should not be I mean I can jolly well call this f x right. So, I can now that I know it must be the p d f of x right I can just call this f x of s right. So, if I am given the joint probability density function I can get the marginal probability density function by integrating out the other variable from minus infinity to infinity ok. So, where so maybe here I should say it where f x of s is equal to integral f x of s is equal to integral minus infinity infinity f x comma y of s comma t d t right that is what I am calling f x of s and because my c d f is expressible as the integral of f x of s this must automatically be the probability density function of x the marginal probability density function of x. So, if x and y are jointly continuous random variables it is the case that they are marginally continuous we have just proved it right that clear, but of course we know that if x and y are marginally continuous they need not be jointly continuous that we have we have a counter example. So, being jointly continuous is a strictly stronger condition than the random variables being marginally continuous Is that clear? So, 
How much time do I have? I have five more minutes. Uh, so next, so next we will discuss the independence of two jointly continuous random variables. Okay. Uh, so we know that. <coughs> see, see, we know that independence of any two random variables is equivalent to the CDF factorizing. Right, that we have established already. So which means that, so if x and y are jointly continuous and independent. We must have f x y of x y must be f x of x times f y of y, but the C joint C D F itself can be written as an integral, right? And the marginal C D Fs can also be written as the integrals, right? So what we can show is that if x and y are jointly continuous and they are independent, uh, you can show that the joint P D Fs must necessarily factorize okay and conversely you can show that if the joint pdfs factorize x and y are independent okay that seems perfectly reasonable right so for jointly continuous random variable so that is something we will start in the next class i don't want to start it now okay i will stop here thanks <coughs>